We are still a huge organisation. We've got something like 1.3, 1.4 million staff. Uh, we've got four or 500 organisations that provide care, um, something like 70,000 GP practices, et cetera, et cetera. All the numbers associated with the NHS are huge. Uh, and we have long had a real issue with leadership in the NHS. That's not to say that there isn't pockets of excellent practice. Uh, they're very rarely the ones that make the headlines because they're just not good newsprint, are they? But we have some great leaders in the NHS. And we also have an awful lot who just aren't ready to do the job that we thrust upon them. These are very, very complex roles, whether you're working at the front line or in some of the most senior positions in health. And what I think we've done uh, frequently in the past, where we concentrate enormously on professional education, we've done very, very little in terms of uh, leadership development and education, as if somehow the leadership role can just be picked up through some process of osmosis as you uh, go through life. And we know, of course, that that's not the case. Uh, so a few years ago, 2012, we set up the Leadership Academy with the very ambitious aim of transforming leadership in health um, and reaching all 1.3 million of our staff and improving uh, their awareness of themselves as a leader, their understanding of their impact on others as a leader, their ability to engage staff differently um, and their ability to provide ex exceptional and compassionate care. Um, and that's the journey that we set on. Uh, in that time, we've developed a suite of programmes. We're going to talk about a couple of them today. Um, we've accessed something like 38 to 40,000 people, which uh, is, a, is a lot of people, but it still doesn't touch the surface of uh, the 1.3 million, uh, hence using some of the technologies that we've used. Uh, interestingly, when we set out, we knew very quickly, um, and as many of you in the room will know, the really expensive stuff about leadership development, and indeed the stuff that often doesn't work, is anything you do that brings people together in a room. The, the pound signs start racking up the minute you p take people away from their desk or workplace and bring them into a location. So we wanted to make sure that when we did that, we were using... Uh, using their time incredibly wisely, that we were making incredibly informed decisions about what we do when we get them together. And then thinking really creatively about how we can enhance their learning in a way that is much more flexible and accessible to them, hence the use of uh, technology. But what we didn't want is some of the incredibly tedious, turgid stuff that many of you will have seen that doesn't stimulate learning, that people can sit glassy-eyed in front of without anything touching the sides um, and tick little boxes at the end to say, thank you very much, I've done that. I'm still, however creative we are about our use of technology, my mantra is that leadership is still a contact sport. Um, I don't think you can learn really meaningful things about leadership on your own in a room. And yet, I think some of the things we've done with the technology that KPMG, colleagues from Leo and others have done for us, I think bring compassion to leadership development online in a way that I've never seen it done before. And that's the feedback we constantly get from our participants, that the emotional connection that they make with themselves as a leader, their personal impact on those around them through this medium is something that they didn't expect uh, and anticipate at all. I'm going to let Louisa talk a little bit about exactly what that is and what it looks like. Um, I suspect for some of you in the room, uh, it won't look enormously different. For others, I hope it does look like something very different and new. Um, and at the end of Louisa's input, I'll talk a little bit about the impact that it's had for us and the changes it's helped uh, us make. And then you can all tell me what I'm getting wrong. Thank you very much, Louisa. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Um, and thank, thank you for the introduction. I guess um, Karen and I obviously have been working on this since 2012, but um, it's very much a, a joint effort. And KPMG um, brought together a consortium in response to Karen's organisation's um, request, which includes a number of um, highly prestigious organisations, uh, such as Manchester Business School, the University of Birmingham, 
uh, Leo Learning, um, who helped us create all the digital and online content, and really importantly, a, a charity, uh, National Voices. One of the reasons and one of the challenges that we wanted was that leaders could always see kind of from their e-learning, from the digital learning, have line of sight to the front line and to patients who are in receipt of their care. And one of the things that I think we did very wisely was include patients on, in the design and they're still involved in the delivery. So I'm just going to try and give you a flavour of what that looks and feels like. So as Karen said, our ambition was to create really fabulous leadership development programmes that minimised the really costly and that really time-consuming, um, important time that clinicians would be away from the front line. Busy NHS managers wanted to do something different. So we created, um, this is our Elizabeth Garrett Anderson programme a Moodle-based, bespoke virtual campus. This programme is designed for people who are senior managers, who lead teams of teams, so are very often kind of the squeeze middle. There's lots going on, and they've got lots of people very senior to report to. So this, this was one of our programmes. We wanted the content to be accessible. We wanted it to be accessible at home. We wanted it to be accessible on mobile devices. And our evaluation suggests we've been very successful in that. And in fact, and I'll show you some more of the content, we've been so successful that one of the unintended consequences is that we're also dipping into that discretionary time that people have of actually wanting to engage in the content on their travel to work, at the weekends and during downtime, because it really is so engaging. As well as being interactive and, um, and very engaging, it, it's also kind of multi-layered. So some of the modules here, which take people through actually a fully accredited master's degree, are designed to appeal to different learning styles. So as a participant, I might be reading an academic article. I might be watching a talking head of some global <laughs> health care or leadership expert. Or I might be preparing for my next assignment. But I can do it all through this community that we've created um, the back engine of it, uh, there are lots of different forums, one-to-ones and cohort forums where people can still, as Karen said, engage in um, the leadership aspect. So just a couple more um, quick samples. Um, I've already mentioned about the social interaction. Our participants also engage in action learning sets. They do that on a very minimal basis, face-to-face, uh, -face, but virtually and through our virtual campus, they're able to engage with people and really kind of tease out what are the real gritty problems in their own organisations and how might they work around them. One of the other things uh, that I mentioned was that real um, value that we had from, from National Voices from actually hearing a patient voice on the programme. One of the design principles is that a patient or a service user or a carer of somebody receiving care in the NHS always introduces one of our modules to the patient, either through the, um, the online content as a sort of talking head. That's really important for us because every moment it crystallises to the participant exactly why they're doing the leadership development, why it matters. This um, screen on the right shows uh, Glen Verne. Glen Verne is a fictitious um, county. I can't tell you how long it came for us to uh, agree on what that county would be called. And Karen's colleague, who I'm sure gave the Star Wars reference, we were very clear it had to be right. Um, so what we did in order to create, this is actually for our, for our more senior leaders, so people who are aspiring to board level, we created a county whereby all of the information uh, in all the organisations in the county is real. So if there's an acute trust there, um, the, the data has come, come real. If there's a CQC inspection, it's a real inspection report, all absolutely anonymised and mixed up. So we, we make the best and the worst of all of the data. What we then do through the online portal is prepare people for what's going to come ahead. So when they are going to come to um, the executive programme, which is a one-year programme, has three residential elements, 
And indeed, our master's degree, a two-year master's degree, also has three residential elements. Ahead of that time, they, they prepare for their learning. They do some online um, getting used to what's going on in, in Glenvern. What, is there a hospital that's about to close? Has there been any, any scandal? What's going on in local government? Thinking about the integration of health and social care. What are the issues? So when they come to their uh, residential, they are absolutely prepared. One of the other, um, again, golden threads of the programmes is that we use real people, uh, real examples, and things that um, leaders in the NHS can absolutely uh, understand. So dealing with a complex issue like how do you take pressure off A&E is something that's clearly very important to us all. Um, and it's a real gritty problem that, that lots of managers and leaders are facing in the NHS. So rather than just kind of let people talk about it, we take them through a number of immersive scenarios. So this scenario, when it's worked through, is 50 minutes. We've told the participants it's high bandwidth, so don't do this unless you know that you're going to be able to be online and have the high bandwidth, and they work their way through it. So it's a decision-based scenario. At different points, they will uh, make decisions, they will make leadership decisions based on the challenges they face, and then the story will unfold based upon those decisions that they make. So with everything crossed for technology, uh, what we've done is we've just abridged this scenario uh, for you, so I can just show you some of it. She came in after I can appreciate Jonathan Shepherd, Professor of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery in Cardiff, where I direct the university's violence research group. And the issue that really set us off on this project was the large numbers and increasing numbers of people injured in violence who came to the accidents and emergency department and appeared on my operating table. Knock, knock. Heading off. Trying to. So, you wanted to catch up? CEO called me in this afternoon. Uh -oh. <sighs> Wants to make a big push to get waiting times down and patient ratings up. With no additional spend. Is that all? Get the team together. Knock a few ideas around. We've got to come up with some quick wins. Well, the A&E couldn't keep up with the number of patients coming in. In fact, demand was so high that there was no way we could achieve our targets. And then, when Laura suggested that we look for some quick wins, I was a bit sceptical at first, to be honest. But then, in the end, we did all agree that there was one particular issue that needed to be addressed. We, we need, to, need try... to get the weekend boozers out of A&E. You want to reduce the waiting times? That's where you start. What we need are more bodies on the wards. You know, we've never really captured any hard data on these kinds of patients. Shouldn't we be getting more information before we start making decisions? Why don't we try both? We look at the staffing and the research at the same time. OK, so um, challenging issue there. Um, participants are very much put in the role of Alex, and they will have seen views of several of his other colleagues as they've gone through the scenario. And then they get to make a decision about the route um, actually that Alex should take. So a number of kind of things that I think probably we would all uh, recognise as, as typical decisions that Alex could and should take. And uh, participants are encouraged to follow that. So we're going to take the third option. We're going to attempt a quick reorganisation whilst looking at the issues. And again, this is a really abridged version of um, some of the outcome. The scenario has quite clearly indicated the real challenges in dealing with a wicked problem. Why is this a wicked problem? Well, firstly, it's because it affects not just the NHS, it affects people beyond the NHS. But most importantly, the resolution of a wicked problem also lies beyond a single organisation such as the NHS. 
But in such circumstances, the tendency for managers and senior leaders is often to go for a quick fix. In the end, we decided to take a more balanced approach. We thought we'd try and achieve some quick wins by looking at staffing at the weekend, while at the same time gathering data to inform our longer-term strategy. Laura was pleased with this approach, at least to begin with. And I think may maybe that resonates for all of us. But um, as hopefully you've seen from there, what we have gone with on the leadership development programmes is very high production uh, value uh, video scenarios based upon real events that people can absolutely um, relate to, feel, feel that they're authentic, and can have then a really healthy discussion in, in their action learning sets or within their cohort. The other thing that obviously it then gets them to do in a very safe way is to kind of think the consequences of their leadership decision. So if Alex hadn't decided to do a few quick wins but had gone against his boss completely, you can imagine that she would have been less than happy. So in a relatively safe way, um, participants are able to test out and think about the human consequences of some of their leadership decisions. We are really proud of um, the emotional connection that we've been able to gain with participants. So throughout the, um, the programmes, we use a number of these highly immersive scenarios, as well as um, more traditional um, methods and certainly the invaluable face-to-face -face elements as well. But in doing so, we firmly believe that we've been able to um, help the leaders in the NHS make that connection towards how their leadership influences both patients and people receiving care on the front line but also staff with whom they work which has been really important it, it's a nod for you yes um, uh, thank you thank you for that a couple of the uh, headlines of the impact um, that the program has made um, for the master's program, we, uh, from the point that we commissioned KPMG in the consortia, uh, which I think was kind of March of 2013, uh, by September we were having participants join a fully accredited master's program that had been designed from scratch completely to meet our needs and most of which was delivered online as Louisa's uh, just talked through. The success rate of people passing the programme is phenomenally high and this year with our first graduates from the programme um, we've had an incredibly high rate of people with the distinctions uh, in their master's programme. So the academic um, pass rate is incredibly successful and conversion into uh, more senior roles has al also been uh, very high indeed for participants on the programme. But the measure for us, as I said at the beginning, was not just that people can acquire the skills and knowledge that they need through this um, learning programme. Uh, our workforce in the NHS, for very obvious reasons, tends to be very bright workforce, so picking up skills and knowledge is not difficult for them. The thing that was really important to us was that they understood who they were as a leader and they were a better leader because of the programme that they'd completed. Uh, and we have a lot of qualitative data na and narratives to share with people that demonstrate that I think we're really having the impact that we want to have. Two or three uh, really quick points. Uh, when we first um, commissioned the programme and said we were going to deliver it online, I had a whole flurry of people from the NHS come up and say, of course, you do know that won't work, don't you? Because we've all got the first computers that were ever built um, sat on our desk and none of it will be accessible. A choice that we had to make very early on was whether or not we delivered a programme that was designed around the lowest common denominator of IT technology that was available um, or whether we ignored that and said, let's go for the very, the very best quality product that we can develop now in a hope that it isn't out of date before we even start the blooming thing. Uh, and that's what we went for. We have had absolutely no problems with people getting access to this uh, uh, programme, and indeed, um, not just for the senior level, but for our frontline staff. So with very little uh, support needed from us, uh, often some, just, uh, some advice to ID, IT departments, but as Louisa said, it's all been designed so it can be accessed on people's smartphones or tablets or, and so on and so forth. So 
um, a little hint to any, any of you who are thinking about doing this work, don't compromise on the quality of the work that you can do in order to accommodate what you might think will be restrictions in access through technology. The reality is people find a way. Uh, so that would be my first thing. Um, and then my second thing I think is about, um, uh, again, being brave in terms of creation of the content. We spent a very significant amount of money in designing and developing this. As Louisa said, we've gone for high quality products and very different learning materials, high production values um, online. My experience in leadership development for something like the past 20 years um, is that the participant cost per access um, absolutely merits that. So we have front-loaded this cost. If we carry on with the numbers that we're getting access to these programmes, uh, we will recover that investment in a relatively short period of time. So that upfront cost, um, however difficult it might be to secure internally, um, delivers its own return on investment very quickly. Another reason not to compromise. Um, I'll leave it there. I know people may have some uh, questions and Mark's going to tell us what we've done wrong and how we might do it all <laughs> differently. Thank you very much. Thank you. It looks incredible. Um, I can feel the personal connection with it, the emotional connection with it. I'm just sitting here. I just wonder, you mentioned that um, you bring people together face-to-face -to -face, um, three times a year. What do they do during the face-to-face -face sessions that, that blends in with what they do online? How do you really use that face-to-face -to -face time to best effect? Um, we, we've done it. Are people in the room familiar with the Khan Academy? I suspect some people might. So this is this incredibly bright... Uh, young man, I think in the States, who developed a way of doing uh, high impact education online. I think he initially did it around finance and accountancy training. How do people understand numbers? And the principle is the transfer of knowledge, the stuff that we would traditionally bring people together for, where somebody stands at the front and talks at them and uh, people sit in a room and scribble notes. All of that should be done outside on your own. That's the individual learner engager. When you bring them together, it is only for their interaction and engagement. So it will be through uh, lots of small group work, lots of simulations. Um, we have as much creativity in the room as we do, I think, uh, online. And, uh, for example, on the senior programme, the small group work, people will simulate board meetings. You know, they'll do those things that uh, public accounts committees, uh, public meetings. It will be... Um, it's the contact stuff of leadership. How do you deliver great feedback to people and so on and so forth? So we make sure that the content uh, is only stuff that you can do when there's somebody else in the room with you. Thank you. Yeah, that was absolutely brilliant. Thanks very much indeed for uh, an inspiring talk. You, you talked about qualitative data. Do you measure in quantitative ways as well? Uh, we do. Um, I'm going to try and give the diplomatic answer here. because So my, the people we get the money from, Department of Health and our, uh, our sponsors, um, tend to be very analytical people who want numbers. So we do do quite a lot of... So it'll be things like pass rates and uh, uh, promotion rates. Uh, people are required to do a change project at work as part of the programme and there will be a return on investment there through things like have you got a reduction in A&E attendance or length of stay. Or, so there, there's a whole load of data crunching that we do behind the programmes. The reality is, I think, for a leadership development program, the most important feedback, certainly in my experience in the NHS, is do the people around you recognise a change in your behaviours on a consistent and sustained basis because of your access to this program? And I think that's very difficult to capture in anything other than narratives and qualitative conversations with people uh, and feedback, though we do do th some 360 work. Um, so my preference, uh, I suppose this is a social science in, in me, the, my preference is always for the qualitative narrative uh, data, but we have lots of numbers because our sponsors like numbers 
back for their money. We, we do also do the sort of the, the typical kind of what do the learners think kind of um, evaluation as well. And they have just been staggeringly high. So um, the, the NHS, as Karen said before, hasn't typically had this level of quality. So they were maybe expecting something that was blue, that was a bit turgid, a bit difficult to go through when they thought that they had some pre-work to do before they went online. And the other thing that we do, in, as Karen said, in both programmes, um, there's definitely that element of, of what's it like to be on the receiving end of me as a leader. So we go back into, and we actively make the participants go back into their teams and then feed that back in via the virtual community of the virtual campus as to how their leadership has moved on as a consequence of the programme. I'm interested to know what step you took before um, developing the programme to find out exactly the needs, the training needs, so that you, know, you have a success rate as big as you've had and how long it took? Um, so, again, it's probably a slightly inappropriate answer. I don't know how many development experts we have in the room, so you can, you can tell me how badly I've approached this. Having been around the NHS for 20-odd years, I know I don't look that old, but I have been around for <laughs> um, one of the processes we could do, and indeed we were prompted to think about, is what's the data collection you need in order to do rigorous data uh, needs assessments across the population, stratified by geography and professional group and yada, yada, yada. All hugely important stuff. And actually, um, for those of you who've been around creating things like leadership competency models uh, or quality frameworks and so on and so forth and developing these programs, um, my sense is your start of a 10 is probably not going to be massively uh, inaccurate. It's probably a good start. So we actually didn't do a huge load of that work. Um, there were a couple of incidents that happened in the NHS. Some of you may know about the, what happened at mid-staffs with the um, unnecessary deaths, really appalling failures in care. There was a few inquiries that had happened, and the inquiries into those pointed to the lack of really compassionate, skilled leadership. And I think those were the things that we stood on to say, let's not, let's not stop doing something while we uh, spend more and more and more time refining the question. Let's just get on and do it. That's a long rambling answer to say I didn't do any of that stuff I should have done. <laughs> I'm really sorry, but it's kind of worked. So. Okay, we're taking the last question. Okay, if you can hear me. Um, I've been extensively working with uh, scenario-based learning for quite a few years. And one of the things which was very interesting to me was that working with subject matter experts, it pushed them to have to reconsider their knowledge and reconsider their wisdom. Um, did you find the same process was happening for you? Uh, hugely. Um, and I'll try and give a really quick answer to this because it's one of my favorites and I could talk about it forever. Um, we, so we started off with a lot of the patient scenarios and you'll of, we often had clinicians in the room, particularly doctors, saying this is all lovely but this is my day job, I don't need any development in this, I work with patients every day, etc, etc. And by the end of those scenarios, absolutely rethinking the nature of the conversations they held, how they connect with patients, the kind of baggage and um, prejudice they bring into the room and so on and so forth. So hugely, hugely impactful. The other quick aside um, uh, connected to that and to this session this morning uh, is we also had a lot of people saying, I'd really love to do this, but actually I never do anything online. We still have chief execs who get their secretaries to print all their bloody emails off. I mean, this, you, you were, you know, we're not right at the front of the curb um, and uh, medical staff in similar situations. We didn't expressly talk about this as a required outcome from the programme, but people's accessibility and use of the product has increased their familiarity and comfort with technology and is already changing some of the ways of engaging. So a doctor saying, you couldn't possibly do a remote consultation with a patient who isn't in the room. You can't possibly get the quality of... Uh, diagnostic right if I'm just looking at you on a screen. Actually, because of the way they've engaged with this programme, they're rethinking that. Actually, we're having an emotional connection with this story. Uh, we're understanding what's going on because of the way it's being presented. So they're now redesigning 
uh, some of their practice around the use of technology because what have they, what they've experienced. <laughs> 